The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. This series is brought to you by Hub24, one of Australia's leading providers of integrated platform, technology and data solutions to the wealth industry. By working with licensees and advisors, Hub24 is delivering innovative solutions and service excellence that enables you to do business your way, creating efficiencies for your business and value for your clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors have rated Hub24 number one for value for money and best managed portfolio functionality six years running, empowering better financial futures together. Find out more at hub24.com.au. Hello, beautiful XY community. Today, I bring you a really different topic. I think I say that a lot, but I do seriously mean, I do seriously mean it. I'm talking to Bryony Benjamin. She's the author of Life is Tough, But So Are You. At age 31, she was told something that we hope no person ever is told. We talk about what her journey was like, how to help people when they're not given great news, and what we can do to support the people around us. I found it thoroughly fascinating. It helped me to understand what I could do better to support those in need. And I think it is very important for us that are running advice businesses to have a practice that understands the practical, easy tips to make sure that someone feels loved and cared about as a client along the way. Enjoy. Hi, Bryony. Hi, Jess. Great to be here. So good to have you here. This is going to be a really different sort of podcast to the ones that I normally do, which is either about financial advisors talking about their stories or people that you know, have in some way or shape uh, a business that amplifies running advice firms or enhancing financial advice firms. But actually, we're going to talk about your personal story, which is actually, I'm not going to say your personal story. It's not mine to share. To kick off, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story? Yeah, well, uh, you know, it was lovely to meet you a few weeks ago, Jess, Mm. in real life. I've heard a lot about you at... um, at our, my sister Molly's um, event at the Ladies Finance Club, and we got chatting, uh, I suppose. And I, I just, yeah, where where do we begin? I told you about um, a, a very, you know, unexpected curveball that was thrown my way at 31. Uh, I was working at the time as executive producer of video at Mamma Mia. It was a really fun role, uh, but sort of 18 months into the job, I just, I had felt pretty rotten the whole time, really. And I was being given advice that I was just a bit stressed and work was overwhelming and I should, you know, rest more. And we did a million different tests, but it never led to anything. And with the insistence of my amazing mum and dad who were on my case, uh, they ended up calling up my GP and saying, look, we don't want to alarm Brownie, but we're actually really worried that she has lymphoma, which is a blood cancer. So they helped me get a referral to a hematologist, which is a blood specialist. Mm. And two weeks ago, two weeks later, um, yeah, I mean, I went and saw her. Two weeks later, she said, come back and we'll get some results. And so I really honestly thought nothing of it. I thought, oh, it'll be another dead end. They'll tell me I've got a virus, you know, blah, blah, blah. And thank goodness my mum insisted on flying down from Queensland to come with me to that appointment. And um, we walked in that day um, and the beautiful specialist, she sat me down and she just said, I'm so sorry, but the results are back. And it is Hodgkin's lymphoma like your parents were worried about. Uh, what that means is we need to clear your next six months. Work needs to stop. Uh, we're going to start you on a course of treatment and we're going to get you through this. And 
it was sort of a, just one of those completely surreal moments of life. You know, I was mm. about to race off to work <laughs> to to film an interview with Sophie Monk who just finished up as The Bachelorette, you know, very important content morning. Mm. Uh, and that's where my head was. And I even remember saying to mum, don't come down, mum. I've got to race straight to work. I don't have time to catch up. Like, um, And then obviously in a heartbeat, nothing else matters other than how long do I have left on this earth? Mm. Who do I want to spend it with and what do I want to spend it doing? You know, your priorities shift in a heartbeat. Yeah. And from that, obviously you went through a period of, from what I can gather, pretty severe treatment and you were quite sick for a long time. And then you went into remission, which is really exciting. Um, And then somehow, which I don't know, you write a book. (laughs) <laughs> How does that come about? Obviously, you're sick. Your whole world gets thrown into disarray. We're going to talk a little bit more in depth about, you know, your journey and what you wish you knew and what um, you wish the people around you knew. But I want to know how did this translate for you into deciding that you were going to write what is a fantastic book for someone oh, that is going through a difficult yes. time called Life is Tough But So Are You. And I want to go through it because I think it can really be used as a tool to support people. But how did it come about? Yeah, well, actually on the very first day of my cancer diagnosis, a um, friend said to me, you know, because I was, a, I was a video producer, I was a filmmaker, that's what I'd been doing. Mm. And he said to me, I think if you can, you should take some time to just go and sit by yourself and just record your thoughts of how you're feeling right now. And I said, oh, yeah, nice idea, thank you, but I don't really feel like that. He <laughs> said, I really I really think you should. Um, well, I don't want to, I don't want to. Um, anyway, I did. I, I took my iPhone out, went up to my bedroom, sat down and just recorded the thoughts of how I was feeling. And um, then all my friends pulled together, actually bought some equipment to go with my iPhone and just encouraged me to document the journey. And I'm so grateful they did because, you know, and I think also having worked at Mamma Mia, being, you know, seeing all the amazing women there that really just openly share a lot of their lives online from, you know, Mia Freeman, Holly Wainwright, these amazing women that, you know, they share things that are then actually really helpful with other people. I think that gave me the confidence to start just capturing and, you know, and a friend said to me at the time, you don't have to do anything with it. Just get it now because you can't go back and get it. And it was fabulous advice. And so from that, um, when I'd finished chemo and I was out the other side and I was felt safe to sort of share because I didn't really share anything while I was sick and in hospital. I didn't share anything until I knew I was in remission and I knew I felt safe to share. Um, I put together a short little video called You Only Get One Life. Mm. And uh, that went out into the world and went viral. And one of the people that saw it was a publisher who reached out and said, I would love to talk to you about taking the essence of this video, this idea of rising to the challenge when life gets really hard and turning it into a helpful book for anyone navigating any kind of tough time. Mm. And that just instantly resonated with me. I thought, one, what an awesome thing to do to turn this uh, time into something, you know, to not to give it a reason or a purpose, but to for some good to come out of it. Uh, and also... I remember I got given a lot of books when I first got sick and they were dark and dense and overwhelming and I didn't even want them in my room. Like, Mm -hmm. honestly, I was like, get them away from me. They scared me. I didn't want to know about chemo. I did not want to know about treatment. And so I wanted to go back and create the book that I wish I had had at the beginning. Yeah. You know, something that was like a best friend that was like, I've been there, done that. You're going to get through this yeah, this is really tough, you know, not sugarcoat anything, mm. but but also not scare you and, and, and allow you to dip in and out and just get the information at a time and a pace that you are ready for it. I was saying to you offline that this is such a great book and that I had a friend, have a friend who had cancer last year and I so desperately wish that I had given it to her when she was going through that process. But as we were saying, it absolutely still is okay for her to go through now because it is a journey and it is a process. And I, I want to come back to that. But before we do, I just want to say that the video, which I think is the one that's on your website, is so good. I haven't seen a video that is so raw. Like your voice in that video made me cry. Oh, Jess. <laughs> and I'm not a crier, as our listeners yeah. might know. It was just so authentic. And, and I felt 
I felt like I knew you. I felt like I knew what you were going through. And I really felt that I was part of a support crew on your journey and watching you, which was, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that before. Oh, wow. Thank you, Jess. That's, that's so lovely to hear. I mean, you know, it was funny. I, I had all this footage, you know, I had hours and hours of footage and I thought, oh, will I make a doco? What will I do? But I thought, no, short form sort of viral content's always been my thing. Mm. And I think, you know, if you can't, you know, to tell a, tell a story impactfully short, in a short and punchy way is, has always been what I love. And I remember people saying to me, Oh, how are you going to be able to convey what you've been through in like two or three minutes? And I thought, just give me a, give me a shot. I reckon I can do this. And uh, my gorgeous friend who, uh, who was my work wife at Mamma Mia, she edited it and put it all together. Mm. But I remember one day I just found that track of music. I loved it. And I just sit there, sat there. It was very therapeutic. And I just cried and cried and cried listening to that song on repeat and just wrote out the story from beginning to end. Mm. What do you do? You know, I think the opening line is, what do you do when you get the worst news of your life? Mm. Um, and I thought, yeah, what did I do? Okay. Yeah. And you instantly who mattered. I, um, called in the 18, you know, mm. I held my mum's hand. I, you know, I kept, you know, and, and I just wrote it out. And, um, so it was just a, a beautiful thing to put out into the world because I, the un, interesting unintended consequence that I hadn't anticipated was I had a lot of people that had been through cancer or supported someone else through it that reached out to me and said, Thank you so much for making that video. It articulated my experience word for word. Like I felt like you had plucked the thoughts out of my head and it gave me something that I could show my friends and family. And then now they understand what I went through because, you know, you, you kind of go away, don't you? You have treatment, you come back, people go, well, oh, how are you? Like, what was it like? And how can you convey an experience like that mm. in a sentence or two? You just can't. You totally can't. And also to help people not feel alone on their journey, I think is super impactful. What do you wish you knew before you got cancer? As in to help for the journey ahead or? Yeah. I mean, what do you like? So you talked a lot in the book about being sick for a long time before you really got it. And I think particularly women, we wait a lot longer before we get diagnosed with something or before we be a burden on the health profession and go and um, seek help or demand a second opinion. From what I gather, you were sick for quite a while. You were having pretty severe symptoms and people were just writing you off really as you know another person who is stressed and overwhelmed with the busy lives that we lead. Obviously, I would imagine that if you could go back in time, you would be more demanding around getting someone to take a pretty serious look because your dad is a vet, right? And so he was the one who sort of pieced together your symptoms and thought, this isn't normal. Yeah. So, so, um, I must give like full credit to my mum who, cause she was speaking with me every day and she was really alarmed by the fact that I was having night sweats, mm. that I was just exhausted all the time, that I was sick all the time, you know, but then I suppose on the other hand, she was always like, Oh, you've been burning the candle, you know, at both ends for years and years. And so you do just think, Oh, have I just worn myself out? But she was sort of really on my case. And she kept saying to my dad, who is a vet, yeah. what could it be? What could it be? You know, like, come on, like, can you have, have a look at this, have a think. And, and he was then the one that said, Oh yeah, I'm, you know, concerned it's lymphoma. And, you know, I think, as you said, we do like women are so more often uh, more likely to ha have their, you know, cancer diagnosis or any kind of like critical health condition uh, ascribed to a mental health condition. It really does go back to that old hysteria thing, doesn't it? You know, just women being hysterical. I think also women endure so much. They endure pain. They are really tough and really resilient, but they put up with a lot more pain than they need to. And we know a lot of these chronic conditions like endometriosis and chronic fatigue and, you know, they're more likely to affect women. Um, you know, I spoke to a neurologist the other day who said the amount of women that come and see her that have just been having shocking migraines and headaches for like 10 years or, or longer and they've just endured it. And she's like, there's a tablet I can give you today that will fix that like in instantly, you know, and just thinking, oh, well, that's just pain, isn't it? That's just what we have to endure. And so if I could go back in time, I definitely would be far more assertive. Mm. You know, you can still be nice, you know, because I think we're always worried. Oh, I want to be nice. I'm a kind person. I don't want to be, I don't want to be demanding. I don't want to be a Karen, you know, whatever. Mm. Um, and I, 
if I'd gone back in time now, I wish I'd just found the strength to say, I need you to know this is having a really severe impact on my life Mm. and I need another solution. So what do I do next? What would you do if this was you? Mm. Um, You know, I I, I met a girlfriend through cancer. She was in, she had a tumor in her chest that was so large, it had collapsed her lung and she was being told she was just anxious. She literally couldn't breathe. Like, yeah, that would make you feel quite anxious, I imagine. Uh, Yeah. And, you know, and so we, you know, and particularly when you're young, you give off a, a vibe of looking healthy. You know, I'm, even if I'm feeling awful, I'm very energetic and I'm very good at masking my symptoms. Mm. And so I think I also say to women, do not wear makeup to the doctor and do not wear bronzer because it just gives this illusion of health. And I looked, I looked really well. You know, I was the wellest looking sick person you'd ever meet. Mm. <laughs> you know, even going into chemo in my first few weeks, I thought, God, anyone looking at me would just think, what's she, what's she doing here? Mm. I think it's a very good lesson and we all know people that have been sick and have deprioritized or thought that, you know, I'm just tired like everyone else. But I think as financial advisors, we have a very privileged space to actually, you know, remind people like, hey, like you've been feeling like this for a little while. What are you doing about it? Who are you going to see? You know, we have conversations with people that no one, no one really gets to have. Um, Obviously, there's an insurance consideration in there um, to make sure that people are insured and looked after. Can we talk about your financial world? So what did getting cancer mean for you from a financial perspective? From memory, you changed some super or you did something um, yeah, so but- so I had tried to get, you know, all my life admin together and get organized. Mm. And on the list of things to do, I'd done it in, in order. I um I decided to consolidate my super because that's what you meant to do. And I switched over to a super fund that had a really low rate mm. uh with host plus, but unfortunately, as I found out later, it also meant there was I wasn't automatically I didn't have a default insurance on that super fund. And then because I'd consolidated, I lost the insurance that I would have had for my other super funds and get insurance was on my list, but it was just one of those things, you know, at the bottom of your list that you just haven't yet got to yeah. that keeps getting bumped and bumped because it's really important, but it's not urgent. And then you get a cancer diagnosis that you're never expecting to get at 31. Um, so yeah, that was, that was really unfortunate because it meant, um, also then because I did have some savings, it meant I couldn't access any kind of support financial support or government support, which is, which is a bit of a double-edged sword, is it, isn't it? Because you've, yeah, you've done the right thing and you've saved, so you've got some savings, but then you have to now dip into your life savings <laughs> that you've accumulated to support yourself through cancer. You know, and I was in the very privileged position that I had parents I could go live with and, you know, they really supported me through that time. But, you know, if you don't have that support network, incredibly difficult yeah. And so, yeah, being on top of your insurances and, you know, your know, financial world, making hay while the sun shines, you know, I think is a good phrase and not just assuming it's never going to happen to you because I never in a million years thought I would be getting a cancer diagnosis at 31. No, of course not. I mean, obviously for financial advisors, this is why we speak to getting the power of advice because we obviously understand all of the ramifications around consolidating your super before you do all the insurances and and why you should be doing it the other way. And so for you, I mean, I can imagine that you've used all your savings. This is, you've had, you know, you've moved back for mum and dad, both for financial support and also just I'd imagine for, for support. But did the treatment, was the treatment really expensive? Was the treatment mainly covered by Medicare, any private health that you might've had? Yeah. Well, you know, and it's one of the things I felt the most grateful for from the entire experience. I think that I, we live in a country that has a fabulous, you know, for all its flaws and the complaints and things that you hear Mm. really does have an excellent public healthcare system Mm. as a baseline, you know, in America, the number one cause of bankruptcy, I believe is healthcare costs for people. Yeah, You know, the fact that I literally could go through 12 weeks of chemotherapy um, and everything that I needed, um, you know, and it was all covered by the government was, was incredible. You know, so there were some costs associated with you have to pay for your, your medications, you know, they're subsidized, but 
you you still have to pay for those every round, which, you know, if you, if you can't afford that, I'm not sure what you do. Mm. Um, there's healthcare concession cards and different things, but really challenging for people. Uh, IVF was um, something that I did. And it was quite funny because, Jess, you, you'll love this. My girlfriends and I, we'd started um, like a, a finance club and we were going through, you know, um, each week talking about different topics and and literally – Two weeks before I got diagnosed, we'd, we'd all been talking about freezing eggs and what that looked like and what the costs associated were. So yeah, it was, it was this quite funny moment where like two weeks later, I came back to them. I was like, Hi guys, I found out a way to fast track that and get a massive discount, few catches. <laughs> but yeah, because when, when you have, when you're being obviously rushed through it, if you've got time to do it, you get one crack at it. Um, you know, if you were doing it normally, you might wait for, you might have a few, a few months of doing it, a few cycles. For me, I had a two week period before I had to start chemo. They were like, we will just get what we get. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the, obviously the ultimate priority here is that you are alive on the other side of this, not that you have eggs, but it was a wonderful thing. I felt incredibly grateful to have that, um, time, um, and the opportunity to do that yeah. and, um, to know that I had that sort of safety net on the other side, but yeah, you know, that my private health insurance kicked in a teeny, teeny bit for that. And there was about a, I think a $1,500 fee that I had to pay. And then you pay an ongoing storage fee every year of about $500, yeah. um, to keep those stored. So yeah, they, that was probably the, the bigger cost, mm. um, financially going through it. Um, Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about how people who are supporting someone or want to support someone who's going through a tough time, be it cancer or, you know, a a different medical condition, because in your book, and I agree, often it can be really hard to know what to do. And, And I think, unfortunately, a byproduct of that is that people panic because they don't know what Mm -hmm. to say to you. So they say nothing because they're scared of mucking up and saying the wrong yeah. thing. Um, yeah. You talk a little bit about this in the book. What did you find or what do you think people should know when they're trying to support someone who's going through something so life-changing? Yeah, like I think there are – I wrote a whole section dedicated this in, to this in the book. You know, I mean, I was very fortunate to have people around me that were really – wonderful and they really got it but I've heard some horror stories from other people um you know be it cancer be it having lost someone they love um you know people we I think we really we want to jump into fix it mode we think that's really helpful to just jump in and start giving advice Mm. and I say in the book you know unless you've been through that exact thing and even then if the person's not asking for your advice just don't give it it's not about you you cannot fix it unless you've been through exactly that thing. You probably, your advice probably isn't that good anyway. Mm. Um, most people just want to be heard, um, have someone sit with them. You know, I, I have a quote in the book where I just say, don't try and fix me. Just sit in the rubble with me and hold my hand. You know, just being there with them for someone to know that they're loved, know that they are supported, know that they are being heard and understood. I think that's really helpful. Yeah. So not jumping into fix it mode. I think as well, I I always go by the rule now, like that for me, it was hearing from people, even people that I hadn't heard from in years and years and years, like, or people I didn't even know. Sometimes the kindness and the well wishes that came from the most random places were the most powerful, you know, to know I, I got a book and a card from a girlfriend's friend who I'd never met. She said, I just wanted you to know that people that don't even know you are cheering you on. Oh, I mean, it was gorgeous. I cried. I cried. I <laughs> that was cried. that was a spot, was it? Yeah. I cried and cried and cried. I cried because I thought how beautiful for someone. It also gives you an opportunity of self-reflection to be like, wow, would I ever think to write a card for someone that I know is a friend of a friend going through a hard time I would now because I, it, yeah, it's been a while. I, I had never. What? Absolutely. But I thought, what a kind, generous human, mm. such a high level of empathy to be like, I don't know you, but I need you to know that I'm rooting for you and that I want all the best for you. Oh my God. It just like, I'm glad that I was reading it in a private place because I was a ball of men. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And, and so now, you know, I always think um, there are very few people in the world 
that when they're going through something incredibly difficult, wouldn't want to know that they are being supported and loved and people are thinking of them. Yeah. So even if it's as simple as just saying, hi, Jess, I know we haven't been in contact for years. I just wanted you to know, I'm so sorry. I heard the news. I'm thinking of you and I'm sending you love. Yeah. But it can be as simple as that. Beautiful. One of the other things you talk about is not asking for permission to do things. And I think that this is something that I really resonated as an independent human. Like if someone, if I was going through a difficult time, I think, and obviously you don't know until you're in those moments. I think if people were to say to me, what do you need? Or can I help you? You know, you, you talk a lot about not wanting to be a burden and that actually just doing the thing and giving someone a choice. Like, I think one of the things that you talk about is like, you know, simple things like, Hey, I'm going to drop you dinner this week. Do you want a lasagna or do you want a salad? Or do you want this magazine or that magazine? Like you're not offering people the opportunity to be, to be like, Oh no, don't, don't bother about the burden. It's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm doing this. Which yes. The ones yes. That you want. <laughs> yeah. And, and cause also when people like, I had so many, you know, well-intentioned people say to me, what do you need? I'll do anything. And it just puts such a burden on you totally. to one, think of it, to ask. And you know, even when I was going through chemo, there is no way in hell I was going to call up and friend and go, can you bring me dinner? Yeah. Or, hey, I just want you to like come and hang with me, you know, and maybe in an ideal world, we would just ask for what we wanted, but it's, it feels hard. And, and you just put more life admin on the person going through the thing. They can't even think about like, well, I've got so much medical admin to get through this week, you know, and now I've got to think of a list of nice things for people to do. So I just say, yeah, just do. Don't, yeah. don't offer, just do and, yeah. and give, give the person an option if you're worried that they might not want it. Do you want this, or this or this, you know, yeah. can I come around and what are your plans? Do the garden or do this? Like, what do you want? I'm coming anyway. You offer some really practical, like I'm obviously just doing the highlights reel. Like what I loved about your book is that it's obviously for someone who's going through a really tough time, but there's like a whole section on the supporter community piece. And you're like, basically just leave this part out. Uh, open yeah. on the bench and ask <laughs> your friends read. to read it or you gift the book to the friends and say, hey, I think this will really help you understand where I'm at. And I walked away going, oh, I really think I understand how I could be a good friend or a good advisor or a good member of my community if someone I know is going through something. So Amazing. thank you for making it really easy for us to make take action, you know, make tangible. Oh, thanks, Jess. Yeah, no, that's lovely to hear. Changes. Um, you had an amazing A team though. Can we talk about some of the things that your friends did with you for you? Because I felt like you really could see or hear through the book, the power of your community. I mean, you had your guy friends coming to do Manny Petties. You had weekly walks <laughs> with people when you were up to it. Like, can we talk about some of the things that people were doing whilst you were in the real, I guess the, is, would it be fair to say the, the thick of it? Yeah. In the shit show. <laughs> in the shit show. Tell us what happened. What did your friends do to help you through the shit show? Yeah. Well, you know, I, my immediate family were just really amazing. My, my beautiful sister, Molly, which is how we met. She yeah. flew back from London as soon as she heard and she was just by my side, you know, right through it. And that was incredibly helpful. But then, you know, just the thoughtful things. So my, my partner at the time, we're not together anymore, but what he was really good at doing, was rallying a crowd and just because, you know, I think a lot of people want to help, but they don't know what to help do and they need a bit of direction. Mm. And so if you can be that person, if you can be the super coordinator, great. And there's actually an amazing app called Gather My Crew that you can download mm. and it, it, you just enter everyone's emails and it puts everyone in the same little group and you can sort of assign tasks. And so that's a really great way to. Just, just help with the actual admin. So there's always someone across it because, you know, as, as great as my A team were, there were definitely times where, um, you know, I think particularly when you're through it, people think, oh, she's through chemo now. She's good. Off, off she goes. And that actually was the hardest time. That's when it got really hard emotionally because you've just been through this huge ordeal. You don't know what's next. You don't know if you want to go back to work or like what's an appropriate time to take off. And so that's when I was really felt the most alone. And, you know, I didn't really hear from, uh, you know, it's very easy to help in the crisis because it's very obvious to people. Mm. But so that that's, you know, I think another important message is just be there once the storm has passed because that's actually when people really need the support. But during it, um, yeah, so like my friends, 
did things like they all got together and for my each round of chemo they would do a really thoughtful thing so it was the first morning when I was going in and they'd all compiled a video of messages and that was really lovely it just gave me a little lift that morning and made me feel that I was being thought of and cared for and the second round uh, they all made a playlist and they each wrote out a reason why they'd given me that song and some were really like power ballads and some were just really silly <laughs> funny ones yeah. um, and then the third one was Oh, what was the third one? Oh, they all spelt their, they spelt we love you, Bryony, out with their bodies. So like everyone did a different letter and they sent that and photoshopped it together. And then the fourth one, they all went and donated blood, which was amazing. Mm. Did a big blood drive because a lot of cancer patients will need a blood transfusion at some point. Mm. And so just thoughtful things that were like a bit silly, a bit playful, but it made me feel really loved in the, when I was in the shit show, as we said. And I think that there is such a nice space for advisors to do, like, maybe not all of those, but some of those things to be like, hey, we know that this is shit. We are thinking of you. Like, our team's gone and donated blood. We want you to know that we're doing that so that we can help other people like you. Like, I just think about that and think that's such an easy thing for us to do and so impactful to the person that knows that you they're doing it, you're doing it because of them. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity for advisors to add so much personal thought into how we can help support people through a, a really tough time beyond gathering insurance paperwork and liaising with an insurance provider. Um, I actually interviewed a guy earlier this year named Adam Crabb and he had a motorcycling accident. He works in the industry. And one of the things he actually talked about as an opportunity for advisors is he wanted someone A, to ask what he wanted, but B, support him with milestones. Because what he said was, when you go through something like this, you're seeing so many people, no one's really doing a holistic view of like helping you get better and achieve different milestones. Now, he was an accident, so I'd say he's a slightly different. But he's like, I wanted someone to be like, cool, what are we aiming for in the next sort of couple of months? And then how are we progressing and what are we doing? He's like, but no one even asked me what I needed and therefore, could never know that I wanted that sort of support and obviously therefore did not provide that. Uh, really interesting, really interesting. I think to your point, you need to ask someone what they're looking for though, right? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, it was a really beautiful thing a friend did for me at the very beginning. I mean, just just amazing when I go back and think about it. He printed off like a list of values and wants and needs. This was in the first week. Mm. And he came and sat with me and he's like, around the like, he like actually down at Bondi booked like a little room in the pavilion and we just sat there and he printed out all these different quotes and beautiful ideas and I was just able to go through it and he's like, this is about you just getting really clear on what you need through this time because it's actually really hard to ask for what you need, mm. and especially if you don't know what it is. So mm. that was a bit different to what you're talking about, but that was a really interesting idea. So I write about that in the book, but mm. it was getting really clear on, yeah, what do I need right now actually? Do I want alone time? Do I want to be surrounded by people? And do I need connection? Do I need, yeah, and, and you know, it was really interesting looking at this list of values. It was so different to the sort of things that I would normally circle. There would be independence and creativity and fun and, you know, I still needed those things, but the most immediate values and needs had really shifted. Interesting. Um, and so that, that was a lovely process to go through, yeah. People are so clever. Like I was reading all – So and clever. Like, <laughs> I, would think, I would never think to do this stuff. This is so, so clever. Interesting awareness that the values piece – had shifted because obviously your immediate needs required something quite different to perhaps mm, mm. prior life or your future life, etc. So you launched the book, which can I just say, I read a lot, is so easily digestible, very tangible, as I think I've said 7,000 times, but it's pretty and it's Oh, colorful, thank you, Jess. <laughs> and it's yeah. really uplifting. I was like, this is great. Oh, you know, amazing. Well, that's exactly book. how I wanted it to feel. Mm. So that's lovely to hear because it is, yeah, I just, you know, I was like, oh, particularly when you're in a, in a funk or in a big giant, you know, huge thing that you're going through. It's like black and white and dense and texty. You know, well, I think that's like my background of viral video making. I'm constantly thinking about the audience, right? Mm. Who is this audience? What would they share? Why would this impact them? Why would this like, be important to them. And it was the same with the book. I was really, really clear on 
who I was writing this for and how I wanted them to feel when they picked it up and exactly, you know, it really was very thoughtfully designed in that way. And in the book, you talk about the power of journaling and you've made a journal? Tell us more. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, so journaling for me was absolutely critical. I would go as far as to say it was one of the most important things I did during chemo and I just became quite religious about it. There's a practice known as the morning pages. You get up first thing in the morning and you just write down three pages, dump everything out of your head and put it on the paper and it's incredibly therapeutic. It helps you just work through a whole bunch of things and, you know, there's no right or wrong way to do it. You can whinge and moan for the whole three pages if you want and it's really important that you understand that doesn't mean you're a bad person. That doesn't reflect anything about you. They're just thoughts and you're just getting them out and you're putting them in a more productive space. And I think it's a really good tool if you're not yet ready to talk it out loud with someone. If that feels too scary, it's you can journal it out and almost almost practice on the page, you know. And over time, the idea is that it gives you clarity. It helps you just process. And, you know, they've even shown that Journaling helps people heal, heal quicker. They're more mm-hmm. resilient after traumatic events. They, their wounds heal quicker because, you know, it really is taking this stressy, um, underlying central processing unit being overwhelmed and removing a bit of that, a bit of that data in a way. Yeah. Um, and so it was incredibly powerful for me. And so I was chatting with my publisher, the book, you know, book had done really well. And they were saying, um, what do you think? You know, you love journaling and, what, what about creating a journal version of this that people can work through um, as they go? So, yeah, that's going to come out in January, which is really exciting. What an amazing tool and what an amazing gift to give someone who's going through a tough time to give them the book and to give them the journal, the practical piece to say, go and do this. Um, yeah. And can I just say two things on that? Firstly, I loved that you said that when you were journaling, the things that were coming out of on your pen you were like, whoa, where is this even coming from? Which shows us how sometimes we're not actually aware of the thoughts that are racing around in our brain. Totally. And I just want to myth bust that journaling is not a girl thing. Exactly. I just want to call that out. I want to hold space for that. And if there's a guy listening to this going, oh, yeah, journaling kid. No, there's lots of the data and the research that you suggest. And I want to hold space and say, no, guys, we can all benefit from that. I think... I think if men journaled more frequently, the world would be (laughs) an improved place. I think it's great for everyone. Agree. Uh, you know, and, and it is, and I, and I know I wouldn't have written the book without that process as well. Mm. There was something very freeing about, I just reconnected with my love of writing, just got it out. And the, it, it, the woman who invented the concept of the artist um, of the morning pages, it's a book known as The Artist's Way, she is just like the amount of creative projects that have been birthed through this, books, plays, films, you know, career changes, just all sorts of interesting things because it helps you get clarity on your life. And the thing that I found interesting is when you're journaling, somehow, I don't know why, but it is impossible to lie on the page. It's really, really difficult to write something that is untrue that you don't really feel. And I, I found I couldn't actually. So it makes you get very clear on what you're thinking. Um, people say really dumb shit when people get diagnosed with something terrible. Um, and you and I are very aligned on this <laughs> point. Like, you know, what not to say, like (laughs) it only happens to strong people or God has a plan or, you know, all of those crazy dumb things that are well-meaning but so extraordinarily unhelpful. Um, Yes. I'm going to try to not ask one of those. (laughs) I'm I'm doing some framing. I don't think that everything happens for a reason. I don't think people get cancer for a reason. I think that's a really dumb thing to say. But Agreed. I do want to know, having been through a really tough time where you've stared down the barrel of really dark questions and had to hold space for who am I and what do I want and, and basically reinventing at a very early age, what have you learned about life or what changes has this led to that have been really positive and please know that I'm not trying to you say, can that- say positive no you can say I, I 100% agree with you Jess it's like I say to people I don't think things happen for a reason some people really love that phrase yeah. um for me it's like 
yeah, like you said, you don't get cancer for a reason. Some, you know, someone doesn't lose their child for a reason. Like it's just supremely unhelpful mm. and actually just really um, dismissive of someone's pain and grief to say those sorts of things. Yeah. But I do believe really good things can come out of really awful things as well, you right. know. I mean, even – even as simple as like the book and putting that now out into the world, that that could never have come if I hadn't been through a really challenging time. Uh, but, yeah, I think, you know, big perspective, perspective shifts, there's nothing like the wake-up call of a health crisis, particularly at a young age. Uh, I think some of the really big learnings were women are freaking amazing. <laughs> they were just the way in which they turned up, supported, knew what to say. My mother was just extraordinary as well, my sisters. Like the women in my life were just amazing. The men were great too, but the women really took it to another level. Um, the, the people that you have around you and in your corner, you know, that determines the quality of your life and really only invest energy and time into the sorts of friends that are going to be there for you when the times get tough, because you fair weather friends, they might be a bit of fun, but they're not going to be there when you need them. And, you know, I, I was, felt very fortunate to have an amazing, amazing crew in my corner, but I've always been very, very strict about the company that I keep, yeah. you know, and, and the energy that I have around me. And then, you know, for me, I spent a lot of time, I've always been really passionate about the environment and the planet um, and climate change. And I had a lot of time to think about that during my illness, but I think I was it was a bit overwhelming to really engage with climate change and those sort of things too much at that time. And that's fine. I, I, I just decided to just put those thoughts on pause while I was recovering and healing. Hmm. But as I came out of it, um, yeah, I sort of, it, it very much increased my desire to make change and impact in the world. We get this one precious life and we also have this one precious planet that gives us everything that we need to sustain our health and well-being, you know, and and we see ourselves sort of as so separate from the environment in Western culture, I think, and in Western white culture. And yet, you know, I had a lot of time, I think, just to look at nature and be in nature, even just sitting out in the garden and taking it in and 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 just being in awe of it, you know. Like when you actually stop and take it in, it is extraordinarily magical. There really is magic just everywhere that we so often miss. Mm. And... Um, a reflection that I finished the book with is this idea that, you know, I think we get so overwhelmed sometimes by the challenges that face our world and we think, oh, it's too hard, like I'm just not going to engage. And I sort of made the parallel that it's a bit the same as a cancer diagnosis, you know, like when I got told I had stage four cancer, oh, that's bad, that's not good, but we never say, oh, well, bad luck, too bad. We, we do everything. We fight tooth and nail. Mm. to preserve that life and that same parallel with this planet. Yeah, the, the problems are big and global and complex, but, you know, I think a new world is possible and I think actually when we're freaked out into overwhelm, we all just are paralysed and we don't do anything. And so how do you keep that hope alive as you do with a with a health crisis or, or you know, if you're dealing with severe grief, knowing that it will get better? Um, I was speaking to a friend on the weekend and he said this most beautiful thing to me. His dad's a farmer and he called him when he was having a really challenging time and he just said, oh, son, the rain always comes, but it, you've just got to right now do everything you can to keep yourself alive until the rain comes again you know and I, I love that kind of idea like the rain does always come mm. but it's just you got to get is it every day is one day closer to the rain coming mm -hmm. you know keeping that hope alive so yeah that was a bit of a long-winded way of saying um you know do, doing something purposeful with your time on earth um you know being connected to a, a community this community really is everything Totally agree. Totally. And look, I think having such a big thing happen to you so young, I actually haven't said this out loud, so I'm just going to see how I go saying this. Um, over the last 12 months, I've actually had two cancer scares, not oh, cancer, gosh, yes. cancer Goodness. scares. And in those Goodness. moments where you're waiting for results, it's really, it's really full on. And, and I obviously had a totally. doctors and specialists in surgery and, you know, you, it is really terrifying and it does create this really beautiful opportunity to pause out of your very busy life and say, what is really important to me? 
and what do I genuinely want slash need to do because I might not be here forever. I'm not here forever, obviously. Yeah, none and of us are. What if this is it? And and for me, it cascaded to a whole, like it ricocheted across my whole life and it gave me profound insight in terms of what I was doing that was very aligned and what I was doing that I needed immediately to come up with a plan to change. And I think in a lot of ways, I'm super lucky because the results were really good, but also I feel really lucky to have been forced in an uncomfortable place to have that really hard conversation with myself and then to take action. And it sounds like you have done that, but far more amplified. Well, what an amazing outcome from a really difficult challenge, Jess. And I'm sorry that you had to go through that. But as we say, you know, good things can come out of terrible, terrible things that you're faced with. So, yes. yeah, there's no, there's nothing quite like that, that, that that in the waiting period is there to go, oh, okay, it's probably are we on track? Am I doing what, what I'm meant to be doing on this earth? Yeah, it's probably why I, like, inhaled your book. <laughs> I think, you know, I read it really fast. I was really influenced. Um, I could talk to you all day, but I'm really conscious of time. Uh, I think every financial advisor and every person that works in a financial advice business needs to read your book because we are invariably going to come across someone in our personal life, in our professional life. And I think the practical tips are so helpful. How can people learn? I'll obviously put a link to the book in the show notes, but how can people learn more about you? Yeah, well, they can go to, I've got a website, mm-hmm. brinybenjamin.com.au. That's Briony is B-R-I-O-N-Y because it's a tricky name. Link to that um, and on Instagram, that's where I spend far too much time but have made some incredible connections with some beautiful women and some amazing men as well. Um, on the on the gram. So yeah, that, that's probably the best place to find me. Wonderful. And before we wrap up, are you okay to do a couple of very quick rapid fire questions? Please. Love a rapid fire. (laughs) I ask all my guests the same ones and I love the insights and wisdom that comes from. So I'd love to know what is one thing that you do to look after your mental health? Journaling. (laughs) Mm. Honestly, journaling. Get it out of your head onto paper. It somehow takes the power of the thoughts away, gives you clarity. I'm going to try that. What is a piece of advice that you would give to your younger self? Sleep. Get as much sleep as you can. After reading more about sleep, I think you know, and, and also the cancer fighting powers of sleep. Like when you release melatonin in your body, it literally fights cancer. You've got to get eight hours of sleep, guys. If you're not, like you're on a pathway to bad health. It's not worth it. It is totally not worth it. Um, tell me something that's on your bucket list. Oh, that's such a fun question. Well, in, let's let's go big audacious goals. Yeah, to write a New York Times bestseller <gasps> one day. Oh, so, I mean, that's more a work related one. But I'd love to go to Cuba one day as well. So Ooh. that's on there as well. Two cool ones. And last one, a <laughs> book recommendation for my fake book club. Oh, nonfiction or fiction? Whatever you or whatever. like. Oh, there's so many at the moment. Um, I'm just reading so many book, good books She's at the moment. She's staring at all of the books in but, her background. Okay, do you know one I really enjoyed and it's a quick snappy read that you can get through really quickly? The Gift of Asking mm-hmm. by this amazing woman, Kemi Nekvapal. Um, mm. She's just a power source. I met her at a conference and it's all about when you ask people for what you need, you actually give them a gift. She's like, most people actually want to give you what you want, but we're not very good at articulating it. And um, sorry, I know this is rapid fire, but my favorite chapter is chapter three. It's just called The Mind Readers and it just has one phrase and it just says, they do not exist. (laughs) So I think it's particularly good for women, right? If we don't ask for what we need, no one can like give us what we want. So yeah. That's one I've enjoyed recently. Amazing. A huge thank you. I know sharing your story um, is very personal and I'm sure it's still painful in some parts to talk about. And so I want to say a ginormous thank you on behalf of the XY community for letting us learn more about your story and also how we can use it for good for others. So a massive, massive thank you today. Thank you, Jess. Well, just an absolute pleasure to have this time with you and I've just loved every second of it. So thank you for making it happen and thank you for reading my book. You know, I think that that's um, been such a beautiful thing to put out into the world and having people read my story and, you know, talk, talk it back together. It's been really healing the whole process. So thank you. 